Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by uh, my co-host, Marissa Dinatali. Marissa, good to see you. Hey, Mark. How are you doing? We're missing Chris this week. We are. Where is he? He's traipsing through uh, the red light district in Amsterdam. No, oh. I'm just kidding. He's in, he's in the <laughs> Netherlands. <laughs> oh, that's right. His mom is, he, he's, he's, his dad is Italian and his mom is Dutch, I believe. And, and grew uh, up in Argentina. Yeah. Oh, a worldly guy. No, really? He grew up yeah. in Argentina? Mm-hmm. Oh, so he, does, does, does he, he speaks Italian. I know that. Does he speak uh, Spanish? He must, I would right? assume so. I've never heard him speak Spanish, but I yeah. would assume so. And Dutch is not an easy language. I wonder if he knows Dutch. I, I don't know. I can't even read. We'll Dutch. ask him next week. Yeah, very good. <laughs> and we've got a we've got a guest, uh, Aaron Klein. Aaron, good to see you. It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah, you're. Uh, this is your third time on Inside Economics, and I don't think anyone's been on three times. Uh, am I right, Marissa? I think that's the case. An outside guest? No, I don't think so. No. Oh my. I, I, uh, yeah. I'm setting right. a record. Yes, you feel, are. You're setting. Uh, you're you know. setting the bar. Yeah, I'm, absolutely. If I get to five, do I get a, a a free sandwich or a coffee cup or something? <laughs> well, that that's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. We do have these cowbells. Uh, you know about our cowbells. So oh. yeah, we play this statistics game, which I don't think. We're oh, uh, yeah, today. no, I played that one time with oh, you guys. Yeah, that's right. And you get a cowbell if you get the if you get the statistic, uh, you know, right off the bat. Uh, but we'll make sure you get that, and also. A bottle of wine. Unfortunately, the bottle of wine is under Moody's gift uh, policy. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it a good bottle of wine, but you know, As one of the best lines in the uh, season premiere of Ted Lasso, which we just watched uh, the other night, was you know the thing: a great bottle of wine doesn't have to be expensive. Yeah, is that right? That's true. That's yeah. that's that was a line said in the uh, in the classic. And the cowbell will make me very popular among the other parents on the opposing side of my kid's soccer games. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, these cowbell bells are heavy duty. I, I've learned a lot about cowbells. Apparently there are many uh, all over the world and, you know, like every valley in Dell, I think that's the word you call it, you would say Dell in Switzerland has its own cowbell. Apparently I could oh. go figure. So uh, we're, we're on the quest for getting the cowbells, but anyway, uh, it's good to have you, and you're a senior fellow of economic studies at the Brookings Institute, and you're focused on anything financial related. And obviously, uh, financial related is all we are talking about this week. Uh, you know, since the uh, the failure of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature, uh, I, it's hard to believe, but that that wasn't even quite a week ago, right? I mean, yeah, geez, no, it feels at some point during this. Pod, the taping of this podcast oh, was right. one week because they closed it while the markets were open, which they are loath to do. The history of bank failures is they they want to do it after the bank closes on a Friday and work all the way. They keep the bank closed on Saturday and work all the way through the weekend and have the mm-hmm. resolution. In fact, during the financial crisis, when all when we had the record high number of bank failures in, in 2009, they would be called uh, Friday blue light specials. Mm. So that the FDIC would close all these institutions on a Friday night and send out notes to all the other banks, you know, who wants to buy this, right? So the joke was like, if you know, if you wanted to buy another bank, you waited for Friday night to see who was on special. Yeah, that's uh, great. And so the fact that they closed the bank in the middle of market day is really a sign that the thing was collapsing uh, faster than a house of cards. Right. And today's Friday, so a week later. And so I think everyone's kind of sort of on edge here, just waiting to see if, you know, there's going to be any other failures. And I guess we'll have to wait till after, hopefully until after the market closes to see that. And hopefully there are no other failures, but I think the markets well, are a little know, nervous. Look, it's an interesting question about how many bank failures do you want? So I, well, uh, mm, if you want to play a game, yep. mm-hmm. uh, uh, uh America starts, right? I'm going to, you know, move us to the founding of the Constitution, not quite 1776. There was a declaration, but, you know, we didn't really have our own legal system. So America starts. What year in America is the first year where not a single bank fails? Oh, now that is a great question. A great question. Uh, Let me think. I'd say probably... 
and I'm, this is just a wild guess, 1832, because that's the year Tom Jefferson and John Adams died. All right. So you think we make it to 1832 without a bank failure, Marissa? It, probably, probably, nine, it's probably 1956 or something. But go ahead. The 50s were pretty stable, right? Supposed yeah, to be a good yeah, era. probably that, yeah. yeah. I'm going to guess there wasn't a bank, there, there wasn't a year without a bank failure until not 2021. I, I know there was no failures in 21 or, or, or 22. Right. That's all I. It, so it the first year in American history without yeah. a bank failure, 2005. Yeah. Oh, that is a great wow. statistic. Man, we should have played the statistics game. That would have been, so, I'm you were ready. Now. Yeah. Oh, the so man. The second year in American history without a bank failure is 2006. And I was up as the chief economist of the Senate Banking Committee at the time. And the regulators come up and they say, we have done such a great job. We are such good regulators that we have such a great financial system where there aren't banks aren't failing because we're regulators. And it made me think, is your goal no bank failure? So we have like a little bit under 5,000 banks in America. And I started asking myself an intellectual question. What is the right number of failures? And I came away convinced the answer shouldn't be zero. Mm -hmm. Zero bank failures has to be the wrong answer. Because that means that no bank is doing any different type of business model from each other, which means that they're all serially correlated in risk. If you have 5,000 banks, a couple should try different things. Hmm. And in the course of trying that, some will be good, some will be bad, right? We Who knew that the answer to cell phones were little towers, you know, a couple thousand feet away from thousands of feet away from each other as opposed to satellites in the phone in the sky where a lot of capital because they thought that was going to be how we we're going to implement cell phones a lot of people lost money investing in those satellites right we have plenty of history you know netscape pets.com right like they're plenty should it be that zero banks fail that's got to be wrong. although yeah i hear you although the most i'm sure a lot of years we had failures a few failures and they're all pretty small institutions that's right so right. that's right. So the answer yeah. has to be twofold. One is you want a few failures, but not a ton. You don't want a domino, right? Banking is at its core a confidence game. Mm -hmm. It's trust. No bank can withstand the loss of trust of its depositors. A mass run will take out any bank, no matter how great the bank is, because of the structure of the nature of the business of banking. So one, you, you want to have it so that uh, it, it isn't a domino. Now, the second question is, do they have to be small failures? That's a little tricky because if you go too far down the road, then you, you fall into too big to fail, right? Which is no bank. Well, it's okay for banks to fail as long as they're not big, then they can never fail. Well, now you've created a, 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 you know, a problem, right? There's a bunch of problems associated with too big to fail. So the, the goal, I think, ought to be it's okay for banks to fail regardless of their size. We have a system design where banks that take risks and make idiosyncratic bad choices, it's contained and it doesn't create a contagion that creates a loss of trust throughout the system where otherwise safe and sound banks fail, not because of their bad business practices, but because of just the loss of trust in the entire system. Well, I also say I'm not sure bank failures is a good guide either, because I'm sure there's a lot of failures that never fail because other institutions come in and buy them up, right? I mean, I'm I'm sure in all those years uh, in 05, 06, 2021, 2022, when there are no failures, we saw a lot of M&A activity, right? Yeah. We're, I think we're down to 4,700 banks, you That's know, right. 4,900 in 2021 and steadily declining. So there were there's effective failure. Uh, well, you know, yeah, look, I'm, I think you're right about that. Uh, in fact, if you look at most banks that technically that actually fail, they tend to be acquired, right? It right. tends mm -hmm. to be the FDIC sells their assets, uh, and from the depositor standpoint, you know, there's almost no change, and it's kind of a different way to make a merger and acquisition. There weren't, you know, uh, people said there weren't mergers between healthy banks in 2009 because it was cheaper to buy a failed bank, right? Because the failed bank doesn't mean it's gone to zero. It tends to have a tremendous amount of value, right? Uninsured depositors historically get paid out over 90 cents on the dollar, I believe. Uh, there's a lot of value in the institution. It's just, you know, insolvent and its equity has gone, gone down, right? We, I think we've all on this, right? All three of us have flown on a bankrupt airline, right? As the airlines. <laughs> oh, 
I must, I'm, almost by Probably, definition, yeah. I'm sure that's true. Yeah, exactly. Unless you just fly like Southwest yeah. and Qantas, yeah. right? Like Qantas yeah. never crashed, yeah. right? Was a, a Rain Man. Yeah. The, uh, uh, you know, all the others have bankrupted at least once. Um, and so the, the I agree with you, failures is a, a perfect measure, but it captures this concept uh, that I think is important to appreciate that the goal of regulation shouldn't be perpetuation of all existing charters. Now, the other point you raise, Mark, is a spot on one, which is we've seen a huge decrease in the number of banks. And the question starts like, oh, you know, we're down to below 5,000. You know, we used to have 16,000 banks in the 1980s. And the point I always like to make about that is, you know, we don't have 5,000 banks because that's the economically optimal number of banks today. We didn't have 16,000 banks in the 80s because that was it. We had 16,000 banks because up until 1994, interstate banking was kind of very difficult yeah. to do legally. And we had a country, mm. it shocks. I, I would, you know, most folks, even, you know, older listeners to the podcast who lived through the experience of the savings and loan crisis may not really remember that it was banks kind of couldn't really branch and operate across state lines up until passage of what was known as the Regal Neal Act of interstate banking. You want to know a quick uh, tangential point. The, the company I started along with my brother uh, in 1990 started because of the breakdown of interstate banking, right? Because at that point, banks needed information outside of their state. And that's what we did. Our company was called Regional Financial Associates. That was our bread and butter, providing that information to these banks looking outside their immediate footprint to say, where, where am I going? And that's the company we sold to Moody's, you know, like 16 oh, years ago. So, yeah. I didn't, so I didn't realize that you got your start being ahead of the curve, realizing this interstate <laughs> thing was coming. And no, you no, it, it, was, it wasn't that, no it was, I wasn't that smart. It, you know, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it when I write the history. Give him that much credit. Like this was coming. No, it happened, and we could see, you know, what it meant, you know. And then also oh, the other beautiful thing was the PC. That the PC was just coming into, you know, commercial use. We went out and bought some IBM PCs, and you know, data was becoming more accessible. And so you marry the PC, some data, you know, interstate the breakdown, the, the interstate banking, and then you know we're off and running. Uh, so, so you know it's. It's interesting you mentioned PCs because there was a brilliant uh, conversation I once heard uh, where where they talked about the rise of computing power changing the economics of banking because the ability to essentially process information and data, which is a lot of what banking is. I mean, banking is the movement. I always say when I do a talk on payments, payments are two things, the movement of money and the movement of information who's paying whom, how much, when, is a very separable element of the payment than the actual movement of the money between the two people. In fact, mm -hmm. right, the actual money of the movement of the money often lags the movement of the information, and that's okay. Um, you know, banking is very information. And that the rise of this has changed the core economics of banking in a way that favors economy of size. So in addition Sorry, to- you just broke up there. What was that? The economies of what? The economies of, of information and data okay. processing right. mm -hmm. change the value of scale and size in banking in a way that favors the bigger, the better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, the, the, the decline in the number of banks in America is a combination of the, the removal of prior regulation that created more banks that were economically, quote unquote, you know, the market would have created to the rise of Moore's law and computing power, which changed the economies of scale to favor consolidation. Yeah. And both of well, one, we can argue how temporary it was. I keep saying, well, you know, we keep changing the law so that, you know, to try and help smaller banks or to try and help bigger banks, we can debate what, what the recent bailout of SVB does in, in moving that led, ledger. But Moore's law is just a thing, right? It keeps going. <laughs> And it's, you can't legislate it away. You can't regulate it away. It's its own power. But I think you're very wise to connect the rise of computing power and the changing nature of our banking system, because I think they're deeply intertwined. Well, I want to, I want to come back to our, our, the U.S. banking system is somewhat unique in that we have so many banks. Most 
banking system around the world are very concentrated. A few banks dominate and they're very few smaller institutions. And I, I want to come back to that at some point in the conversation, but let me let me bring this back to the, the recent events. And, you know, the basic question is, you know, how big a deal is this? What, what caused the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, and let's say SVB from now on, and Signature, and how unique are those failures? Or is this symptomatic of something, you know, broader in, in the system? What's your sense of that? Right. So I've done a deep dive on SVB. And... You know, first of all, what, what caused the failure of SVB was absurdly bad management, right? And I've identified four core factors within the bank that are clear red flags and why their regulator uh, allowed it is beyond me. The Fed. The, correct. The Federal Reserve regulated Silicon Valley Bank from head to toe. Usually in bank failures, we start talking an alphabet soup of different regulators because you have a bank regulator, you have a holding company regulator, you have blah, 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 blah. The Silicon Valley Bank was one of the largest banks in America that the Fed regulated from head to toe, along with the California state regulator. So America has state and federal bank charters. In fact, uh, per uh, uh, you know our earlier conversation and Marissa's historical insights, Right, we only had state charters up until 1863. We didn't have a federal bank charter until the until it was created under President Lincoln, who created it because it's hard to have state-based banking when half your states are trying to secede. So, um, uh, but in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, head to toe, Fed plus California. Hmm. Here are the four red flags I've identified: one, explosive growth. The bank quadruples in asset size over five years, going from around uh, 50 to 200 billion. Anytime you see a financial institution grow this fast, it's a little tricky because the types of internal controls, risk monitoring, all the rest are very different when you start to hit that hockey stick of growth, right? That's not usually how banks grow even, you know, larger institutions. You know, just uh, on that point, a uh, CEO of a major bank uh, that, that is no longer with us uh, said to me once, he goes, Mark, if it's growing like a weed, it's probably a weed. So uh, I thought that was, to me, like the key principle to good risk management. <laughs> if it's like, if it's going hockey stick, it, it, it could be, it could be real, you know, for sure. But you got to go take a really hard look uh, at you know why that's happening, and um, you know that's really critical. Yeah. So, so you know banks are different, right? This 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 isn't like a you know social media platform where you want that kind of growth. Banking is different that way. So two. Yep. Paper reliance on uninsured deposits. So mm -hmm. banks when SVB failed, it was two hundred billion dollars, sixteenth largest bank by asset size. It had sixteen branches. I actually think the true number is closer to four. The definition between a branch and an office can be a little squirrely, but I'm just going to use the Federal Reserve's own data on this because let's not get into a data debate. So 16 branches. The other $200 billion banks, Key Bank, M&T, Fifth Third, Huntington's, right? These are the banks that are around $200 billion in assets that are banks, Main Street banks, community banks, regional banks, they'd be called, right? They have about a thousand branches. If you're a two hundred billion dollar normal bank banking people and businesses and communities, you have about a thousand branches. They had sixteen. They didn't bank people; they banked business, specifically tech businesses, biotech businesses, venture capital businesses. Right? Businesses have a lot of money in the bank, and uh, most of it is uninsured. And uninsured depositors, when there's a sign of trouble, are more likely to run from the bank than insured depositors. That's the purpose of insurance, right? And so, you know, anybody who's listening uh, to the podcast who has under $250,000 in their bank account, which is the vast, vast majority of Americans, uh, your money is safe, whether your bank is or not. Don't run around and try to move your money it's there. You'll have access to it. Whatever happens, the government stands behind the first $250,000, everybody's bank, money in, in a bank account. And, you know, that's people. But businesses behave very differently. And when a business runs, it, you know, takes a lot of its money with it, right? If it's, if it's afraid. And so that's 
95% of their deposits were uninsured. That's insane relative to their peer group. Okay, here's a statistic. I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to turn this on you. What is the average, what was the average size of a deposit at Silicon Valley Bank before its failure? Ooh, average or median? No, the good question, but I, I don't know the median. Average. Average. Oh, that's lovely. So you had you had one crypto with over three billion. So that's gonna knock it over here. Uh, I'm I gonna guess know. three billion. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, they got bailed out. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna guess the average deposit was fifteen million. No, no. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 1.25 million, 1.25. Over a million bucks. Over a million bucks, 1.25 million. Okay, here's the other for context. Yeah. What's the average size of a deposit account at a regional bank? Mm. These are these are the big yeah. ones. Yeah, this, 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 I think I'm going to be much closer. So yeah. I was doing something about it. And I, I, if you just took Americans, forget about businesses, but just people. And you took 20 people in a room together and you lined them up by income and you grabbed the 19th highest earner. And you said, what's your bank account? How much money do you got in the bank, right? 19th out of 20th, he'd say $69,000. So that's a th- under a third of that, right? For the 19th rich guy, forget about the 18 below him, right? Um, so I'm going to guess for the average regional ba- bank, the average amount in their bank account is like eight grand. Oh, no, no it's, that's too low. <laughs> Well, I like the deductive reasoning, though. That that's kind of cool. One hundred and seventy-seven k. Okay, seventy-seven k. So, it's, so it's, again, these are goes, averages. Yeah, I think that's not medians. Not, not medians. I think the median would, I'm sure, would be closer to the number the the eight k that you mentioned. But yeah, uh, but nonetheless, it gives you context. So that's reason number so they're, two. They're, right, right. So they're they're about seven or eight times as high. Yeah. And the core the core insight isn't just that it's seven times as high an average balance. It's that 177 is fully guaranteed, so yeah. you don't have to worry. And right. 1.25, a million bucks of your money is not insured yeah. Yeah. or wasn't before the bailout. Yeah. What's number three? Okay. Number number three, interest rate risk. So when this thing exploded, they went, and I did a little Twitter thread on this. You can follow me at, at Aaron D. Klein. You pull up their call report, their publicly available information from like 2019 and they have like 20 million bucks in Fannie Freddie uh, mortgage-backed securities. Two years later, or three years later, they have 100 million bucks. So you remember when you could get a mortgage at three and a half and 4% and you were wondering who's buying, like Silicon Valley Bank didn't originate those mortgages, right? They didn't really lend to people that much. They Somebody else originated them, Fannie or Freddie securitized them and they bought that mortgage security. And then they didn't hedge it. I didn't. I couldn't find any hedging in their balance sheet. So you have a hundred billion dollars of mortgages and some treasuries. It was most that I saw unhedged against interest rate risk. And you know, as 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 you know, and and most listeners, I'm guessing that this podcast know right when interest rates, when you hold low yielding securities, the value of that security falls. And that, you know, that eats into your balance sheet, right? Now, whether they're unrealized, the accounting rules on that, whether you have to realize or unrealize that has to do if you're holding the security, holding to this or that, but it was unhedged interest rate risk. Here's Banking 101. Here's another statistic to strike that point home. Uh, and I'll play another, another game. Uh-oh. What, what do you think uh, SFB's tier one capital ratio and tier one is like uh, oh, high yeah, quality, yeah. Capital and capital is the cushion that banks have to digest any losses on their uh, lending. It was like, it was, I want to say it was a, a book value, like non accounting for the actual yeah. losses that they right. had. Yeah. I think was around like uh, 8%. 12%. 12%. 12%. So, and what was it if you mark to market? Zero. Securities? Zero. So you, to your point, if you take the securities, uh, and value them at current market values because of the rise in interest rates. And all of these securities had interest rates with coupons very low. Uh, the value of those securities, and this is both in their uh, so-called held to maturity book where you know they had no plans to sell uh, sensibly and also they're available for sale, which is where they did need to mark. 
But if you did both, then there would be no capital left. And they yeah. were effectively insolvent. So that that's your point. Right. So uh, um, so that's number three. And by the yeah. way, th this begs the question, the Federal Reserve saw this as their regulator. I would think the Federal Reserve might know that interest rates are possibly could rise. Uh, and I'm not saying, you know, the central bank should have inside information and regulate banks in a way that isn't what they're telling the world. But last I remembered when they started rate hikes, Chairman Powell was very clear to the entire world that the Fed was going to aggressively raise interest rates to stamp out inflation. This wasn't like a secret thing. The monetary policy people in the Fed weren't telling the bank regulation people, right? It's like if you're a bank regulator and you see your bank that you're regulating doesn't have interest rate hedges and the chairman of the Fed is out there saying we're going to aggressively raise rates to stamp out inflation, like alarm bells, where's your cowbell? Like who's ringing that? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so point that was three unhedged yep. interest rate. Yeah. Point four, uh, I call dash for cash to the federal home loan bank system. And uh, so, your Silicon Valley bank, you're sitting on these mortgage backed securities that are losing value. You can't, you don't want to sell them, right? Because then you're going to take the loss and realize the loss, but you need liquidity and money. So there's this thing in American banking, it's an anachronistic uh, holdover from the 1930s. President Hoover signed it into law called the Federal Home Loan Bank System, which existed in a time where there were things called thrifts, which were different than things called banks. Uh, and thrifts made mortgages and commercial banks didn't really. And uh, we can get into more of a history lesson on this. And Freddie Mac actually comes from the Federal Home Loan Bank mm -hmm. System, if you go back roots in history. Uh, uh, but the home loan banks today will allow uh, any commercial bank uh, who's a member, insurance company, some other people to park mortgages on their balance sheet and give them an advance of liquidity and cash. Which is what and, the Fed's doing now. Correct. In fact, the home loan bank system has been called the lender of next to last resort uh, uh, because folks do this, uh, including there's a brilliant paper by Scott Frame, who's then at the New York Fed uh, uh, and now is at the Dallas Fed, uh, uh, documenting how Countrywide, WAMU, IndyMac, all these folks uh, uh, ran to the home loan banks in 2007 uh, as their mortgage business was imploding. Remember, like the, the real estate market peaks late 06, Right in 07, you're seeing all these troubles in this situation, but the bank failures hadn't started. And you wonder, well, how do they hold off? Right. It's like, what do you do when you're Wiley e. Coyote and you've run off the cliff? Right. And you know, don't look down, right? You fall when you look down. So you keep running. The home loan bank is what kind of lets you keep going. So a year ago, the uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank appears nowhere on the federal home loan bank top list of borrowers from San Francisco, their home loan bank. A year later, they're the number one borrower with $20 billion. So within a year, they've gone and put at least $20 billion of these mortgage-backed securities to the home loan bank for cash. Now, one huge thing to realize, the FDIC, when a bank fails, goes in and takes over the bank. You think they own everything. Guess the only entity in America that legally has a right to the bank's assets before the FDIC, who gets paid back in full before the FDIC gets to see how much is there to give to the uninsured depositors, other claimants, Uncle Sam. FHLBs. They, yep. yep. They're in first in line. Yep. So the home loan bank gets paid back. So the bank a year ago was in trouble. It starts hollowing out its assets putting itself at greater risk of loss if it loses to the taxpayer, to the uninsured depositors by running to the home loan bank and blowing up its exposure there, which is exactly what equity does when in trouble. When equity is in trouble, it makes riskier and riskier bets to double down because if it wins, it wins. It can't lose below zero, right? And so, right, this is all... You know, the same well, on, on this point, I, I would, I disagree. Uh, I, I mean, I think the federal home loan banks play a very critical role in the system broadly, particularly to smaller institutions to provide liquidity when there are 
panic scares events. Now it can't solve every problem and you will have institutions that, you know, ultimately go, go belly up like SVB, but there are many, many cases where because of the federal homeland bank liquidity, it allowed those institutions to survive and fight uh, on for another day. And that goes back to uh, uh, the need, in my view, for keeping uh, a lot, you know, having a banking system with a lot of in uh, smaller institutions. Because if you didn't have the federal loan bank, we would probably, I don't know the counterfactual, but my guess is <laughs> we would probably be more like the banking systems overseas that are highly concentrated because liquidity is very fleeting, particularly in these smaller institutions. But having said all that, I don't. I, that's a, that's another podcast. That's a whole nother debate, which I'm going to have you on because I uh, actually do some research in this area too and take a different view than I think it sounds like you're taking. No, no, no. So, so let me be clear because we're actually in more agreement than it sounds. Okay. Okay. Right. The federal home loan bank system put out ninety billion dollars over ninety. I think almost a hundred on Monday in liquidity to help small institutions during a panic. I have no problem with that. I agree with you. They play a vital role. But so what it's not I, anachronistic. So you said you called them anachronistic. Now, I call them anachronistic in the sense that they were originally created to be a central bank when these things called thrifts existed. And they didn't have access to the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve was only for banks. So it was like a central bank for thrifts. And now there is no <laughs> difference between thrifts and banks. In fact, both their members, both can access the Fed and both can access the home loan bank. So but we it, digress, we digress. But, we digress. Just, but let me make the core point. Okay. Let me make the core yeah. point. The core point isn't that the home loan bank system doesn't have a lot of va value and provide a lot of incentives and should exist. The point is that when an institution off the radar to a massive amount of money during times of good, there was not stress last year. Not a single bank failed last year, right? I'll give you two other institutions that ramped up their home loan bank exposure last year. Silvergate and First Republic. If you look on the list, number one was uh, um, uh, Silicon Valley SVB. Number two is First Republic, right? Uh, um, so what it is, is it's a signal that an institution yeah, I agree. is in totally trouble. Agree. Yeah. So the, well, that's another, that's, what you're, that's a great point. You're saying, uh, number four, why didn't any, you should have seen this because the advances, the loans they were taking out from the federal bank were taking off. And that's a sign that you got a problem. There's a problem, a liquidity problem there. So right. where, where were, where was the Fed effectively, you know, based because that was another sign. Hockey stick, a lot of uninsured depositors, the interest rate risk in the in the in the asset side of the balance sheet, and the federal home loan bank advances. Yeah, totally, agree. a combination of all those things. Yeah, yeah. Should yeah. Have... It, it, that's exactly. Yeah, each one begets each one, right? Right. right? Explosive growth. Well, where's it coming from? Uninsured depositors. Well, what are they doing with the money? They're buying what they think are safe assets on the credit side, but they're not hedging the interest rate risk side. And then, oh, they got into trouble a year ago. How are they managing this trouble? How is it that they didn't implode then when rates started rising? Well, they kept going to the home loan bank rather than take the expensive hedge, right? <laughs> if you rewind the tape, point when all this stuff was obvious, the supervisor needs to sit down with the bank and go, look, you built up a pretty unhedged exposure. You got to eat the hedge. And the hedge is expensive and your earnings per share are going to fall. You're going to have an ugly earnings report and your stock price is going to lose value, right? Keep in mind, SVB triples in stock price from like 250, right, to almost 750 between 2020 and 2021, I think 2022, right? So the same time you're having the hockey stick growth in assets, the stock price is shooting up. Why? Well, it turns out they weren't paying the money for that interest rate hedge, Right, unhedged exposure is more profitable when the market's in your favor. Rates stayed longer than people expected. Right, particularly COVID. Right, twenty nineteen. Right, rates went down. Right, your twenty nineteen mortgage book looks better. Uh and you know you're 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 loving the ride up. So so the broader point though here to bring this back to the be beginning of the conversation is that it feels like what you're saying, and I think I would concur that this is idiosyncratic. This is a feature of a few institutions, you know, obviously SVB 
And Sig Signature and Silvergate were crypto banks, so they have their own idiosyncratic thing going on. But broadly in the banking system, <clears throat> It, it, these may be issues, but they're nowhere near the issues as they were in these institutions. Right. So, I mean, I'd say, so one, broadly speaking, I think this, the under, absent the run of confidence or trust, the system had some pretty strong points. There's a lot of idiosyncrasies, but you look at the FDIC who published a chart uh, on Monday, oh, um, a week ago, Monday, I think, that showed some pretty large unrealized balance uh, balances across the system on the mortgage security. Nothing like Silvergate. Silvergate was a total outlier. I think, Mark, you faintly between the tier one capital at 12 and the unrealized at zero. And their chart, I think I saw it in the journal, that tried to do the same thing for all the rest of the banks. Well, if you do, uh, just to, because I know the statistics, because I calculated them, I didn't look at the FDIC, so hopefully they're roughly the same. But if you go look at the GSIBs, these are the globally systemically important banks. These are the big guys. They they have a boatload of capital. But if you look at tier one capital, it was around 13. And then if you mark to market their security holdings, uh, both the held to maturity, which they don't need to do, and the uh, available for sale, which they do need to do, it's down to around 10, you know, 10. And by the way, 10 is higher than what it was before the financial crisis. Yeah. Uh, regional, that banks, a regional banks, just to round that out, they're, they're, they're in a little bit different situation. And I'm speaking from memory, so I might not have it exactly right, but their tier one before marking is like nine, 10%-ish. And now with marking, it's down to 7%-ish, you know, something, mm. something along those orders of magnitude. Tier one, tier one. Category. Tier one. And does that include any... When you say mark to market, does that include the hedging that they've done that would would no. buffer the loss no, of the no, security? No, so no, it could even no. be higher. Yeah, because I, I couldn't. Cal I, I don't know how to calculate. Yeah. That's pretty. I don't have the information to calculate. The, the derivative hedge exposure is difficult. Yeah. All you see yeah. in the banking call reports. Yeah. So I'm like, being. I'm know. overstating the case because most of these institutions they hedge. I mean, uh, you know, they didn't. They, they're uh, pretty. They're well managed and they and they hedge, but but nonetheless. So, so, so you, it sounds like though, then you're saying, yes, the system is on pretty solid ground, but you know, maybe there might be some other, other issues out here because of the unrealized losses on their, on their treasury and mortgage security holding. That's what yeah. it sounds like you're saying. That's right. That's right. So, but even when you, per your analysis, even when you incorporate that things are worse, but not insolvent. Yeah. Not, not even close to insolvent. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so the level of the magnitude of it, and then the core question, right? Like, where was the hitch? Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move the conversation one step forward. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, the, the US government stepped in aggressively on Mon this Monday. Uh, the, the FDIC, the Fed, and the US Treasury came together, uh, proclaimed this a systemic event. And this is something they can do based on uh, uh, the post financial crisis reforms, and said that they are uh, that they are going to guarantee the deposits, uh, all the deposits of failed of these failed institutions. Uh, now, effectively signaling, I think that if anyone else gets into trouble here, or most anyone else who gets into trouble, any other bank, those depositors are money good. They're going to get their money, whether it's two fifty k below or above. They're going to get their money. And the other thing the government did was uh, the Fed stood up a credit facility uh, to uh, allow banks to use their security holdings uh, to borrow against them to get liquidity. And they could borrow as if those securities uh, had no unrealized losses, that they, they were at par. So they can go out and borrow money. And it's a one-year loan at a somewhat higher interest rate to you know, make it a little less attractive, but nonetheless. And then the third thing they did, the government did uh, 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 behind the scenes, was they uh, cajoled and uh, organized 11 big banks to come in and provide $30 billion of deposits to First Republic, which is another banking institution that uh, you know is in headquartered in California that's under uh, a lot of pressure with deposit outflows. So those are the three things they did. Uh, so the first question, Two basic questions. The first question is, uh, what do you think of those steps? You know, do you think they were appropriate? And second, are they going to work? Uh, do you think they're going to work in 
uh, restoring that confidence that you talked about and stabilizing the system. So question number one, what do you think? Was that the right thing to do? I would have done something different. Okay. All right. Um, you know, it, one, let me say it's really easy to say I would have done something different and not be in the chair of the people doing it. <laughs> right, right. I was in that chair. I lived through TARP. Because you were in Treasury. You were in Obama's I, Treasury, I, right? I was in Obama's Treasury. And before that, I was uh, Dodd's chief economist on Senate banking. So I helped write TARP. So I lived through TARP from the two and a half page proposal the administration sent us. By the way, fascinating little story mm -hmm. tied together. The original proposal from uh, Secretary Paulson was for the troubled asset uh, relief auction. You may recall, Mark. Yeah, do, uh, reverse auction. That was a wacko reverse auction. Yeah. So that's Tara. If you if you do the analogy, right? Yeah. All right. And what it you know what what does Tara conjure? Uh, Gone with the wind. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that's it, Marissa, right? Ta right. How does it do that? Gone with the wind, Tara. That was the is name that... of the the plantation, and it was Gone Tara. With the wind. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. That, I, that I... is exactly the right. So think about that idea, right? We're heading into a financial crisis, and the government's like the name of the government's program <laughs> is the the the, the de, you know the decrepit plantation and Gone <laughs> with the wind. That's funny. And so all of us in Senate banking are all baseball fans, you know, uh, and we're sitting around here and one, we're debating the wacky re reverse auction versus what we thought was the right thing to do, which was capital injections, which is what the Treasury Department ultimately did. And we gave them the authority. The original proposal didn't even have authority for capital injection. We added that even though at the time of passage, they still said they were going to do the auctions. They reversed course wisely. They're, you know, they, they, they were wise. Well, it was in theory, it was a brilliant but theory. Yeah, but, you know, actually <laughs> implementing that thing, you know, pretty, I don't know, couldn't do it. Certainly not given the time that you had, that the Treasury had. So, so we yeah. thought to ourselves, what's the right analogy for the American public, right? It's not gone with the wind, right? It's a tarp, right? When you're in a baseball game and the storm clouds come and the rain comes and everybody has to leave the field, you roll out the tarp. Storm passes, you roll it back, feels good. We can oh, all come back so out and play. That is so interesting. I didn't know that. That is so cool. Right. That's so a, we is just that widely known? Is it just me? I, is that most, I, I, I don't know if that, that was in uh, uh, some of the various books. I mean, you know, I, you I sit around, yeah. just change one letter in the acronym. Yeah. Uh, but right, TARP is, you know, among the banking world, a household name, right? Like, you know, for good or bad. It, it just for folks out there, we're kind of talking to you know, beyond folks, but this is the bailout. Remember the bailout, $700 billion bailout for banks, uh, the housing industry and the, and the vehicle industry. That was TARP and it got voted down by Congress initially. Chaos ensued. And then Congress reversed itself within 24 hours, I think. Mark, since, since you point that out, when, they, when the House voted down the original bill and market chaos went absurd, we regrouped and said, what can we add to this bill to get more votes? One of the things we added, increasing the deposit insurance cap from 100 to 250. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can go back and pull up the, the, the yeah. roll call vote on the text put before the House, which was the deal, right? If the House had passed that first deal, the Senate was going to pass it, the president was going to sign it, and that would have been the law, no increase in deposit insurance. After the House votes it down and we need more Republican votes, we go, what are the things we can give? that will attract more Republican votes that aren't going to mess up the core premise of the bill, right? Because some people want to do all sorts of different things, right? And one of which was an increase in the deposit insurance. So that's how you even get from 100 to 250. But, um, you know, the, the, the core kind of point that you're raising Right, which is what should we? So I just all this is by you way. Said you were going to you would do something different. Do something different. different. All of this, yeah. all this is saying. Uh -huh. You know, I don't have access to the information they had. No. I wasn't subject to the time constraints that they were, and wasn't requiring the level of consensus that is required to turn all the keys. Right? I mean, because the Treasury, the Fed, and the FDIC all had to agree. So even you know, even if Aaron was in charge or whatever of one of those levers, if I couldn't convince the other people to do what I wanted to do, right? One. Could you have sold SVB on somebody else? Could you have sold the bank and its deposit network 
to another institution. That would have seemed to me to be preferable. That's very much how the traditional bank failures are resolved over a weekend. The other bank gets the business. They pay some money for it. In the United Kingdom, they did that. I think that it was sold for one pound. Yeah, to HSBC. But that's one pound more <laughs> than, than we got in this failure. In fact, it's a lot more because we're going to suffer the, the losses. So that's option one, which I oh, think but, was but preferable. In, in, in all fairness, that goes to the information, right? I mean, you can't do that unless, I mean, they tried. I mean, at least reporting suggests that they tried. Well, they, and they, they, they failed. Well, they, failed. they tried. They got some bids. The reporting says that one of the main hiccups was legal indemnification in case of lawsuits, which, you know, at various levels could be provided, right? If you go back, right? And one of the reasons we keep going back is because going back is deeply illustrative, right? A lot of banks going back bought failed banks. WAMU, which is the larger failure, right? We Everybody says Silicon Valley Bank is the second largest, right? These are all nominal terms. WAMU was larger, but WAMU was sold. WAMU didn't get uninsured deposit bailout because, right, JP Morgan bought it. But WAMU got sued. J what JP Morgan underappreciated in that purchase, and I think Jamie Dimon has said this, is I knew the assets of the bank, I knew their liabilities. What I couldn't know was what their legal risk was for the scuzzy practices that they'd been associated with in all the crappy toxic mortgages and subprime stuff that they had been part of. So I got sued, not for what JP did, not for practices under my watch, but for practices under what I acquired's watch. And part of the people suing me were the government. And right. he said, fool me once, right? And so even if it's not JP, the other industry. So could you have offered legal protection? Would that have made a difference? I don't know. But the reporting seems to indicate that was one of the hangups. Well, I, I, I would, I think, I think most people would agree with you. If they could have sold it over the weekend, that would have been preferable. Maybe, although you know, I'm not sure that would have stemmed the the the, the confidence slide that we're still, you know, it's still I, even despite all the things the government have, has done here, which is inc massive. You know, they people have no reason to worry about their deposit, but nonetheless. There's still a well, lot of angst yeah. out there, right? So, but it, you know, there that's a case where I, I would I kind of sort of give them the benefit of the doubt because of yeah. the information. I mean, but okay, fair enough. Okay, what what else would you have done? I would have had the uninsured depositors take a haircut. Oh, you would have because of moral hazard. Why? For a variety of reasons. It's not just moral hazard. You know, it's it's the way the law is. Right? Well, no, and, the law says if it's systemic uh, and they deemed it to be okay. systemic, well, but the I, can, Federal Reserve, I can guarantee that that's the law. I understand that. But if, yeah. if, if SVB had been deemed systemic before that day, they would have been subject to enhanced prudential standards under the Federal Reserve. Right? The Federal Reserve is the one who decides whether or not you're systemic for regulatory purposes. And the Fed had chosen not to subject them to enhanced regulation. But but the reality was they were systemic. I mean, they, well, at least that was the judgment of the people involved. I mean, they that say, was the okay, judgment if I don't do people. this, the system is going to evaporate in front of my eyes, right? So it's a judgment I mean, call. Look, right? look, 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 I mean, the judgment was also said that if we didn't bail out money market mutual funds due to COVID, it would be systemic. If we didn't, if the Fed didn't bail out junk corporate bonds, it would be, I mean, there's been a lot of deciding that things are systemic that have resulted in large taxpayer gifts to wealthy holders of, ass, of, of investments who didn't quite turn out the way they'd hoped. But the risks are asymmetric. I mean, you may be right, but if you're wrong, that's a problem for everybody, including, and most importantly, for low-income households. And uh, well, you're gonna, they're going to get crushed. They're going to get crushed in, in that kind of scenario if, you're talking in about fact, get, it turns out to be you're systemic. You're talking about getting crushed in the recession that would come. Oh, not, yeah, not, yeah, not about yeah. the deposit. Well, well I mean, maybe the bank there be maybe there could be a lot of bank failures. So it could be pretty messy to everybody look, for it, everybody involved. What, what what you're saying is true. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I believe there's some low income people, uh, and I, I it would stagger me if there weren't right that experience hiccups in their paychecks as a result of this. Right? Yeah, sure. W one of the arguments that was being said was, well, businesses need this to meet payroll. I'm dubious of that claim. I'm sure that's not. I'm sure that's true in some business case. Right, but Roku had four hundred fifty million bucks. Well, 
Look, oh, small, like, talking now as a small business owner with yeah. cash in the bank, and at the time, I, I, it, was, it was a long time ago, so I had over 100K in the bank. If I didn't get that money, I, payroll would have been a problem. Well, but hold on a second. How a much? How much of that money did you need? So Roku had 450 million bucks. By the way, Roku had 450 bucks at Silicon. They had other bank deposits, right? And so they would have had access 60, 65% of that money Monday morning. Were you running your business to the point that your bank account at was times, going- I, Thames, I was trying to figure out whether I should pay my electric bill. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, look, okay. Yeah. You so, were yeah, running no, real close to the narrow. I, yeah. I, but, but, but I, I when, don't know how many of those those guys at Silicon Valley Bank were in Silicon, the situation I was in. But no, right. No, and, yeah. But we do know Roku, right? Roku had about, four, I think, 470 something million. And they would have had access to a little bit under 300 of that immediately. And then the rest they would have gotten access to over time, Right. The history says that you probably would have gotten 90 to 95 cents on the dollar, but depends. By the way, one of the ironies is the tumult in the market has radically increased, decreased interest rates, which has increased the value of the security that they'd held that they'd lost, yeah, right. right? So the, the, the carcass of Silicon Valley Bank is worth more today than it was a week ago because of its own failure. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you another question on the moral hazard, just to explain that to the listener. The idea is that, you know, if you have uh, big depositors, they need to be sensitive to the financial condition of the bank they're putting their money in. If, the, if they don't care, th th then th that incents the, the financial institution to go out and take bigger risks with their deposits because everyone, you know, knows that they'll, they'll, they'll get their money back. So by uh, not forcing a haircut on these large depositors, uh, you run the risk that no one's disciplining the financial institution and making it sure that it's prudent right. in, its, in not, its practices. Right. Not, do you, not do just, you find not that just, a, 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 big, yeah. a, a good argument? Yes. Uh, not just Silicon okay. Valley Bank, but all banks, right? Because as you point out, if another bank failed, right, it's implausible to imagine that their uninsured depositors wouldn't be made whole. And and this was a question that I think Senator Lang at this time at this Secretary, point in time this, because of the today, action. Yeah, Friday we talked about like we're taping this on a Friday. Another bank yep. could fail over the weekend. Yes, could you right. imagine if it was small, like super small? Not at this point, no. That that's hor economists call that horizontal inequity. Two equal. Like, Peter Thiel had fifty million bucks in Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah, he's getting all fifty million of that. Yeah. There's no way if you had the smallest bank in America fail and you had one person who had thousand dollars they're going to take a haircut right yeah, i mean this goes about, back to it's systemic I, i'm worried it's but, i'm talking the about system. the least systemic bank in america if it yeah. failed over the weekend right would their uninsured depositors be made whole i, I think in the current environment uh I, I suspect they probably would be yeah i mean if they and, were and they would be because i think they they would it I would be outrageous is so fragile right so now every bank is systemic in this current environment, yeah, it's, yeah. we Every, are in a systemic all 4, crisis. 4,700 are systemic. <laughs> yeah, they are. And the same with the credit unions? Yeah, every institution, it, it, if I were king for the day and I was sitting there today, it, literally yeah. today, Friday, yeah. March 17th, so everybody's, looking what's going. Right. Yeah, so in this environment, systemic. in this environment, right. absolutely. So, yeah. So I'm going to read uh, uh, a quote from, the, from what became the Banking Act 35, by the by, by FDR's Did you charity. Just have this handy. I mean, you say you have the Banking <laughs> Act of thirty five on your computer screen. What's, what the heck is that's all about? Okay, it's framed on his wall. Yeah, yeah. Go <laughs> ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so they they're debating what the deposit insurance cap should be, right? In the New Deal FDR era, in the midst of the depression. <clears throat> this is the chair of the FDIC, Roosevelt's yeah. New Dealer. Quote. Okay. We recommend that the maximum limit of insurance to any one depositor be retained at the present figure of $5,000. Congress in establishing deposit insurance was presumably most concerned with the mass depositors with small accounts. Our reports cover 51 million accounts, of which over 98% are fully insured with a $5,000 limitation. Many of the accounts not fully covered are interbank accounts, public funds, deposits of corporations, institutions, and trust estates. The actual number of individuals with deposits in excess of $5,000 is probably less than 1% of the total number of depositors. Blah, blah, blah. To raise the limit of insurance above $5,000 would materially increase the maximum possible liability of the FDIC. 
If all deposits were insured, this would be more than double. It would be increased, uh, blah, blah, blah. The insurance corporation's interest in the sound operation of banks is more tangible and more vital than that of any supervisory authority. Deposits in practically all commercial banks and trusts, uh, hold on one sec, da, 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 da. there are two courses open to the FDIC. They be a charitable institution which will pay for the mistakes, bad banking, and dishonest bankers, in which case the cost of insurance must be set so high that it will be an injustice to every sound bank. Or by placing that on a sound basis, the corporation may be used as an instrument to improve the standards of bank management and reduce the losses to depositors through bank failures course, which I prefer, requires that the standard of bank supervision throughout the country be improved, that the FDIC be given the right to protect itself against excessive risks, and finally, the FDIC not be handicapped by taking into the fund banks which are unsound or by continuing in the fund which are mismanaged, end quote. Look, I, 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 I'm not arguing that all bank deposits should be insured or guaranteed forever. Uh, I'm not arguing that. I think we need to roll that back. And I don't. I, maybe we take the 250k How? up to something. Our, when the systemic crisis is over, we, but, we but, are now. But, in a, but then the next systemic, systemic crisis happens. We are in a systemic. In my view, confidence is so fragile that if we allow any depositor to to not right. to get a haircut, we're 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 toast. The whole so system Mark, is going to come on. Mark, you yeah. just so I understand your your view. There's some systemic non-systemic toggle. Yeah which the government picks that's right and it's a, because they have it, information to make that judgment yes well but hold on a second we know what their information of their judgment was 10 days ago not really was, we, yes, we, we do have, Be, no we we do because under current law the federal reserve is required to all banks between 100 and 250 billion dollars as to whether or not their their failure would be systemic no no the, no yeah, I understand that. I understand what you're saying. That's ex. That's ex post. Now you know. No, that's ex ante. I mean, it's ex ante. Now we're we're in we're in the real world. But, but this is you're, you're observing the right. so, uh, so, so, so the government got it wrong. System, and you're and and because of the law change after the financial crisis, you now have the ability to say, okay, we're in a systemic crisis or environment. No, but and in that period, I am going to guarantee all the costs. I understand that. My point to you, Mark, is. Before the crisis, the government got it wrong. Yeah. Whether, I'm sorry, well, the Federal Reserve got it wrong as to whether or not the failure of well, Silicon it, Valley it, Bank would trigger this. individual institution topic. may be non systemic, but when you take it in the context of the environment that you're in, but one the context of the environment you is, the context of the environment is 100% predicated on the failure of SVB. No, no, it's not. It goes beyond that. It goes now, it, it goes, does. Well, no, even before that, I mean, the economy was weakening. You know, there was a lot of angst over the economy and where that was headed. Recession risks, you know, most economists think there, it's, the, it's the entire backdrop of, you know, the environment so, that you're, you're operating in. So uh, also, it's, it's, it's a global system, too. I mean, you could see I, the system seemed to be writing itself and then Credit Suisse becomes an issue over well, in, in Europe. I, 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 there's a great piece in the FT where the European regulators were trashing the U.S. decision to bail out the uninsured depositors. Uh, I think one of them called it a joke uh -huh. uh, and said, I've sat through years of their meetings and lectures about systemic risk. And now, right, uh, it, it's you, the, the scenario that you're describing where sometimes uninsured depositors get bailed out and sometimes they don't. They only get bailed out if, if the failure is systemic is going to lead all uninsured depositors to go to the too big to fail banks. That's uh, there's no way to keep the community banking system which I think both of us you and I I think I think systemic world. events are rare, you know, they're maybe once every decade or 15 years. We've had three since 2007 third. Right covid was systemic People got bailed out, right? We didn't okay, have to go through bank failures. Generally, we the money yeah, market. COVID, COVID is COVID. I mean, okay. Every recession yeah, is systemic. Yeah. I mean, this, the 1990 recession, we had the savings and loan crisis. That was a systemic collapse of that. Every recession becomes systemic almost. Yeah. yeah I, I Well, it's a, maybe it gets abused. I don't know. Maybe as, as we move forward here, this becomes you know a regular occurrence for the think, folks in power to do it. But I- 
so far that has not been the case. But anyway, we're, we're, well, let's move on. Let's move right. on because there's a couple. There's a there's so many things I want to explore with you, and we're going to run out of time. The one other thing I wanted to talk about, and then uh, last thing I want to talk about a little bit is if, if you've got any of you what this means for monetary policy, you know what the Fed should be doing next week. But before oh. we get there, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, you know, one of the the things uh, the debates that have come to the fore in this is around the rollback of some of the Dodd Frank because Dodd Frank was the piece of legislation passed after the financial yep. crisis that reformed the system, more capital, more liquidity, stress tests, and everything else. That that was rolled back a bit in uh, 2018, maybe more than a bit. Uh, and one of the things, one aspect of that was that for banks with less than 100, $250 billion in assets, and of course, SVB and these others are less than $250 billion, they did not have the same kind of stiff requirements on capital, stress testing, liquidity, uh, than at risk management that you know banks over 250k uh 250 billion uh do you what do you think is that a, a reasonable uh, uh debate argument i mean do you think that had an impact that rollback on the, the events that are un unfolding here today let me say the following dodd frank subject banks over $50 billion to enhance prudential standards, tougher regulation. That threshold was changed in the legislation you're describing, often called S-2155, from 50 to 250, mandatory. SVP, as we all know, went from just under 50 to 200. The key point, there are two key points. One is the law said it was mandatory over 50, and then it was changed to discretionary between 100 and 250 at the discretion and mandatory above 250. So, one, clearly the Fed botched its discretion on whether or not to handle, put in enhanced prudential standards between 100 and 250, right? This gets back to the conversation we were just having where the Fed judged SVB not to be systemically Import, their failure to be not systemically important, right? Two, had the Fed judged it right, would enhanced prudential standards have caught this? My core point, getting back to the beginning of our conversation, is you didn't need enhanced prudential standards to catch this. It failed basic right. prudential standards. This isn't a question of whether or not the honors test would have caught you, right? You could could you have passed the honors test? You shouldn't have passed the remedial test. Now, maybe the honors test would have flagged it sooner. Maybe not. We can go back. I think there's already been varying pieces of analysis at looking at each debate, right? The stress tests, which is another element of enhanced prudential standards, which the Fed touted as being a major advance, stopped testing for interest rate risk, I think, in 2015 on an upright scenario, right? So, you know, the third level analysis is going to be, well, you know, it depends which test you were using. The test that was being used by the, you know, uh, uh, Democratic era regulators was tougher. The Republicans weakened the test, right? It wasn't just a question of whether you had the stronger test, it was the honors test. It was this or that. My core point in this conversation is the basic test should have caught this thing. And I think that the bigger issues here have to do with the core competency of the Federal Reserve as a bank supervisor, right? We use the term regulation and supervision interchangeably in discourse, but they aren't. They're separable concepts. Regulation are the rules. Supervision is the enforcement. You know, I know, Mark, we, we share a, a, a fandom in football of the same team, but of the same game. I, my, my fandom's shrunk, as has the uh, uh, value and competence of my team, right? I've you're, lived you're through- the, You're the uh, comp Washington. Uh, com com commanders. So when I was a kid, Washington football was a great yeah. organization from head to toe with a great owner and a great coach and Joe Gibbs yep. and won three Super Bowls. Yep. And we had a horrible owner who's like possibly the worst human being on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> I take over the team in Dan Snyder and we've suffered through nearly 25 years of misery and disgust. Like I, I gave up my long? ticket 25 years. Wow. Just about. He took the team yeah. in like 97, 98. It's yeah. complicated when you take yeah. ownership and blah, blah, blah. Jack can <laughs> died for a while. Right. Like, like when you have a bad owner, the toxicity of that franchise from head to toe 
is revolting. And like, I, you know, I don't think I watched, I didn't watch a full game. I don't know if I watched more than, you know, 30 minutes. I watch soccer now mostly. So my point to you here is, right, uh, um, in football, there's a rule as to whether or not something's a catch. And sometimes you watch a game and you see a play and you're like, oh God, that's really tough. And like two rules experts disagree. And like the actual play doesn't really comport with the rule book. And it's so weird. That's regulation, the rule book. Supervision is the enforcement. It's the referee. Sometimes the ref just botches the call, right? The rule isn't the problem. The rule's crystal clear. <laughs> the ref just made the wrong call. Hmm. Supervision can't be legislated. Congress can't legislate judgment or competence. They can make the rules and they can decide we're going to write the rule or we're going to give you the discretion. You write the rule. Congress can decide how much of the specifics to fill in in the rule and how much discretion to give the experts, the regulator. Right. But they can't legislate competence and judgment. And so in this case, if, if the old Dodd-Frank rules applied to banks down to 50 billion, that certainly would have helped with the supervision. Right. Maybe. Because well, almost by definition, because then then these banks would have had taken these stress tests that the big guys take every year. They would have taken them. But the well. stress test stopped testing for raising interest rates in 2015. Which, which, by the way, that you're right about that, which I'm so confused about. I mean, when, when I got the stress test, because we do a lot of work with the banks and helping them in their capital planning and their stress testing. When I saw the stress test and didn't see an interest rate shock scenario, I was perplexed by that. What do you, that just blew my mind. Do you, what do you think that was all? I, I think this gets to the core thing, right? Which is we keep being told over and over again, trust the Fed. They're awesome. They're super smart. And you raise the point about monetary policy. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and I want to get to that because our time is limited. But and one, I one, just to this. nail you down. So you're saying it, you don't really think it matters. If, no, I think it mattered. Okay. I think Dodd it Frank mattered. Yeah. The Dodd-Frank rollback mattered. But it's right? at the end of the day, it's the supervision that really matters. The, how well the regulation was implemented or not implemented. If you're saying, yeah, if you're saying enhanced prudential standards would have helped in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, yes. Would they have necessarily gotten it and had the thing happen sooner? Hard to know. Never know the counterfactual. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's if you can't pass the remedial test. Why are we sitting here arguing whether the honors test was should have been applied and should have been written better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's move to the Fed and let me frame it uh, in this way. So the Fed obviously has been aggressively raising interest rates for the past year in an effort to slow growth and bring inflation back down to its target. Those interest rate hikes, you know, fundamentally did contribute to the stresses in the banking system. But that's by de you know by design. That's that's how monetary policy works you know and one of the channels is that it it, uh, it works through the banking system and makes banks more cautious in their lending and that slows economic growth so no, no, nothing unusual about that but here we are uh the fed has a meeting next week uh the question you know that is uh on uh, folks in the market's minds at least is should the Fed continue on with its rate hikes, which it would most likely have done if we had not had the events <coughs> of the last week, or because of the events of the last week and concerns about financial stability, the ones I've been expressing and you've been expressing, should they pause? No one's quite talking about an interest rate hike, I mean, cut at this point, but you know, a lot of discussion around pause. So as that is a frame, you know, take that wherever you want to go. Yeah, with so, so Mark, let, let, me, let me take that in, in a couple different ways. One is, the week before, right, Silicon Valley Bank failed, Chairman Powell went around the hill. Republicans pressured him to lower bank capital standards and to not, go, not be a tougher regulator. Uh, nobody asked him about problems with Silicon Valley Bank. Nobody asked him about financial stability that I can see. And he projected, no, he didn't raise the issue at all to Congress, right? That Monday, before he spoke, the chair of the FDIC went out and gave a public presentation to the Institute of International Makers and said, there are a lot of unrealized losses on these mortgage-backed securities. So the chairman of the FDIC is waving the flag on Monday. Powell's not saying a word on going around the hill. Nobody's asking him about it either. In fact, the questions look pretty bad in, in retrospect. Mm. And now, boom. 
right? Uh, we were talking about the central bank as regulator and as monetary policy center. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's a thing about institutional management and organizational philosophy that I've been reading, which says that all organizations only have one telos, one guiding, one guiding principle, core, most important thing to the institution. What word did you use? Kilos? Telos. It's, it's Greek. T T oh, telos. Telos. Yeah, my Greek telos. pronunciation yeah. may be poor, but yep. Got my, it. my uh, boss and mentor, uh, the late great Senator Paul Sarbanes, uh, you know, a, a proud Greek American who Indeed. frequently spoke in Greek among some folk and, you know, would, would, would use Greek words uh, and concepts in, in the ancient Greeks. Um, brilliant, brilliant man, Rhodes Scholar, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful senator. And, and I often think, what would he do in this situation? He says, in Ori's eight, you know, telos is the guiding core principle. The Federal Reserve's telos is monetary policy, as well it should be. It can only be, guiding principle can only be monetary policy, and you can only have one. Now, bank regulation, should that be married in with the central bank? Or are we going to constantly see these problems where number one, there's a good frontline special uh, uh, where Sarah Bloom Raskin, who is a Fed governor and a deputy secretary of the treasury and a Maryland state banking commissioner, said the same thing, said the number one thing of the Fed is always going to be monetary policy. Bank regulation is this thing punted aside, right? Um, uh, uh, and so here we've entered a bizarre situation. Fed Chairman Powell has been trying to prep the markets for an even greater interest rate hike, 50 basis points. You look at the, was March going to be yeah. 25 or 50? If we take this podcast 10 days earlier, that would have been the dominant question, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you have a system situation where bank instability, driven by the failure of the Fed as the supervisor of Silicon Valley Bank to have done the right thing to it, a couple of years ago as a, as a supervisor and head this thing off has now interfered with their monetary policy. So you can pause rates and be dovish. Stock market will go up, right? Presumably, right? There'll be more confidence in banks. The value of the losses that these banks hold on this, these types of securities will diminish, right? And is that going to then, what does that mean for inflation? I, I I haven't followed this. Was it the PPI that was due this morning? That was yesterday. That, that was yesterday. Was good. It was good. Yeah. It was a good number because the number yeah, it was yesterday or the day before. It might have been the day before. It was Two days number. ago. Two yeah. days ago. Yeah. The days during SVB like blurring for months. I know. The, yeah. the um um the the prior number was bad. Well, the the, the CPI was bad, but within expectation. So really, markets didn't react. And of course, right. they were all but, focused but, on. But if I'm asking the question, hold aside market, yeah. I'm asking the question, is inflation coming down? Is inflation getting well, it's under? It's coming down. Is, is it the question? Well, is but it it's coming statistically down coming, enough? right. It's coming down because of what, you know, the numbers that are rolling off 12 months ago, Danny Blanche. No, I, well, that's a whole nother discussion debate, but. But the but, CPI number was not great. Right. Well, it, let's put it this way. If not for SFB and the SVB in the last week, the Fed would have raised at least a quarter point, probably maybe 50. But now the question is given, and there's real economic consequence to what's going on now, right? I mean, look, the, the financial conditions here are going to tighten. The banking system is going to become more cautious. And yes, you have some benefit from lower interest rates, but they're not down that much for, they're down for treasuries, but they're not down for mortgages. They're not down for corporates. You know, the actual borrowing rates haven't really come down that much. So the net of all of that is probably a meaningful drag on economic growth, which would be disinflationary. So in that, con and of course, there's a lot of uncertainty. Who the hell knows what's going to happen next? And, you know, how much financial stability there will remain and what's the fallout of that going to be? So those those things would, would argue, hey, uh, Fed, just why don't you take a break, pause, take a look around? You know, if the system stabilizes and you get another a strong job number and CPI number, you've always got the May meeting six weeks from now, start raising rates again and fight inflation. That would be my argument. But so, but so Mark, Mark, you're saying that and, and you know, I've been very critical of the Fed. I'm not a conspiratist. Right. But I, I'm, I'm I've been critical of their job as a bank supervisor. 
we haven't even talked about their holding company regulation and, and what was going on <laughs> with the venture capital fund of right. Silicon Valley. Right. Subject of a different podcast, but I think could be the next shoe to drop. In oh, this then story. we're definitely having another podcast. <laughs> yeah. That with um, the better home loan banks, we got to have you back. Number four. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you should have Kate Judge and Con Hurley join that one because they're oh. really when it comes yeah, to yeah, that. yeah. That would make um, for a real interesting podcast. Yeah, yeah, sure. Kate, yeah. They're, they're really good. Um, yeah. um, uh, uh, or my or, or Mark Calabria, their former yeah. regular Karen Petro. Yeah. Oh, Karen's great. So, um, yeah. the the point you're, you're saying is this banking uh uh uh, uh earthquake, right? It's not a tremor right? It's a quake. It's a quake. This yeah. quake is going to be disinflationary. All else being equal, yeah. So even though interest rates have fallen for treasuries, the drag on economic growth as a result, right? Because there is a macroeconomic point, and you made the point about working people, and I think laser-like on working people. I made a comment, I didn't finish it, that the payroll disruptions, right? We got sidetracked on how big that was. Somebody missed their paycheck on Friday, because of this, some uh, 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 it, it was reported a coffee shop that I go to in D.C. Compass Coffee, not as good as Bump and Grind in Silver Spring, but still, when you're in D.C., you got to get a coffee. Wawa, my friend. Wawa yeah. is strong. Wawa, yeah. I love the Wawa. Um, <laughs> the, the the point here is, um, uh, they said they had problems making paycheck. Did one of their employees get an overdraft over the weekend because their paycheck didn't come through on Friday? Overdraft is a huge business. Huge punitive cost. It doesn't cost a bank 35 bucks to give you money to cover your overdraft when your bank, when your payer doesn't come through. They didn't suspend overdrafts over the weekend. Peter Thiel got all 50 million of his dollars guaranteed, but somebody is eating an overdraft because their company didn't make payment because of SVB and the regulators, right? Yeah. We've had a failure to focus on working people and protecting working people while we're running around making sure that Peter Thiel has access to all 50 million bucks immediately, not two thirds of his 50 million bucks with a potential well, small haircut for having an uninsured deposit. By the way, rumors also that Thiel encouraged his yep. company to yank their money, causing the run, right? And I'm not blaming the companies that yanked it. I'm just simply pointing out that if you're- Back to monetary life, policy. I mean, I hear you. Yeah, but back to monetary policy. Back to monetary policy, I have no problem with the pause. Pause. I've okay. I've I've often thought, you know, that is raising are raising rates attacking the root cause of inflation or is the root cause of inflation a supply shock as it relates to covid as it relates to energy, right? What right? Because monetary policy works to curb inflation far better on demand shocks than supply shocks. Yep. And if you believe, as I did prior to SVB, that supply shocks were more at the root cause of inflation than demand, then the impact of, of rising rates is less influential on So yeah, I'm trying I'm to be intellectually you. consistent and no, no, I'm with my you. priors from March 1. Yeah. Uh, and that would be where I, you coming yeah. on your podcast is tough, man. You really, you really get you down to, you know, <laughs> well, you know why, you know why, uh, Aaron, because it's just in our DNA, because we have to actually put pen to paper, create numbers, put it in a database, clients use it. And then they come back and say, well, why was it 3.45678, not 3.54678, you know, that, so we're, you know, we're down to brass tacks here, but this was fantastic. And we're, we're going to have to call it quits because I know you're incredibly busy and you've spent well over an hour with us. Thank you. And we didn't even get to a bunch of the other debates. Well, that was a great podcast. I want to thank everyone for listening in. I do want to mention that it was obviously a busy week and I was on two other podcasts you might want to uh, tune into. The first is uh, The Big Picture. That's a, another Moody's uh, Talks podcast that we uh, went into depth uh, with uh, Bill Foster on the uh, on the debt limit issue. Bill is, is the uh, analyst in the rating agency that uh, uh, rates the uh, U.S. government debt, and uh, I think you'd find that very interesting. And uh, In the Bubble podcast with Andy Slavitt, uh, I was on with uh, Justin Wolfers and uh, uh, Ben Eisen of the Wall Street Journal, and we were obviously talking about uh, recent events in the banking system. So those are two other podcasts that 
you might find of some value. And with that, dear listener, we're going to call this a podcast. Talk to you next week.